the calibration process, two examiners will be examining each of the clinical cases and agreeing what the signs are. And if the two examiners disagree that a sign is present, then we can't use that as something you need to get. But in the clinical stations, that means that we will expect, we will usually say that there are two, three, or four signs which are crucial and you have to get it to pass. If, on the other hand, there's a very soft tip of spleen that we're thinking is pretty difficult, then we may decide that that is okay to miss it. Or it may be a very soft diastolic murmur. But before you come in, we will have agreed whether you have to get the, the sign to, part, to be regarded as satisfactory at that level. In the talking stations and in station five, we do the same process. We actually, one of the examiners will behave like a candidate and will practice the technique to check that the surrogate is giving the right history in the right way, to be fair to you. And we want them to be consistent. Okay. We work the examiners hard. They're all off to see their surrogates at the moment. Uh, so just remember that in each station, we don't have a clue how you've done in the last station. Each of these stations is like a mini exam in itself. So if you did badly in the last station, the only way we'll know is if you come in looking terribly sweaty and looking upset. That's not going to influence our marking but it will influence your performance. So if you do badly, and I have to say nearly all of us as examiners remember that we had a case that we didn't like in the exam. It's funny, we can all remember the exam, even if it's for me a long time ago. Uh, and the important thing is if you have a bad case, you have not failed the exam on one case. You can't fail the exam from performing badly in one case. You actually need to do badly in at least three cases to fail the exam. So just remember that. And when you go into the next station, just try and put behind you what's gone wrong and perform well in the next station. Prasad's already said this. Do not expect any feedback from us, okay? The we are told not to give you feedback because it can be misleading I can, and we've had appeals by candidates uh, about that sort of process. So when, you, when we ask you what are the positive findings, you say three signs, don't expect us to nod, smile and say well done. You'll get nothing back, okay? You don't have a clue or you shouldn't have a clue whether you're completely right or absolutely wrong. So we're meant to be like poker players. You can't read us. So just don't be put off by that because some candidates assume that because we're not smiling and nodding, you've got it all wrong. And then you start making up things. And if you make up signs that aren't there, you usually do very badly. Examiners hate you to make up signs that don't exist. So don't expect feedback from us. So what are you being assessed on? In the clinical stations, it's pretty much you know, a doing element, uh, gathering information, then the talking element, and the thinking element. It's all fairly straightforward, but that's really the way uh, the process works. Now, this, this is not meant to, I'm not asking you to read this, it's on the, uh, on the website if you want to look at it more closely. But you are not passing and failing on the basis of your performance in each encounter. So you're not saying, well, you did badly in neurology or you did badly in cardiovascular. You're being assessed on seven clinical skills. And the seven clinical skills are, can you examine a patient in a logical, structured way that looks like you've actually done it before. If you're all over the place and pick up a tendon hammer and it looks like you've like it's a strange weapon that you've never handled before, examiners are going to be unimpressed. So you should have a structure to your examination. It should be effective and you should cover all the, all the requirements of each system examination. 
The most difficult skill around the world is skill B, eliciting the physical signs from the examination. Then skill C is communication skills. Skill D, differential diagnosis. And uh, it's important that, if you, that where you're sitting the exam, it's the differential diagnosis in the country you are sitting the exam. You don't need to try and guess what it is in the UK, because that's not relevant. The differential diagnosis is the one where you are. So that's one of the advantages uh, for you sitting in India, if you're an Indian candidate, that you don't need to try and imagine what the differential is in the UK. It's a differential that you would expect normally in your normal hospital, okay? Skill E is clinical judgment, and that's trying to ask you, pose you questions or issues to check your judgment. It may well be, what, how would you investigate this? How would you manage this? But equally, it might be, uh, it, it can be a sign, why does, why does the, the murmur get louder in expiration rather than inspiration? In other words, we're going to be asked, we can ask you questions like that. Or it might be uh, that uh, this person, uh, you know, is going to, the, is going to uh, the dentist next week. Is there any advice you'd like to give them? So, in other words, to try and make you think on your feet and answer specific questions. Skill F was mentioned already. That's answering patients' concerns. In three of the five uh, stations, the patients ask you questions, and you need to be able to answer those questions. If you say, I'll come back to that later, and you don't, you've lost all the marks. If you don't answer the question, and that is important. So the, you'll find out in the course, you'll probably see people who don't really answer the question. Some people think they've answered the question, but the examiners may not agree. Uh, skill G is really just not hurting the patients. We've already heard from Dr. Sahadullah about the importance of respecting the patients, uh, not causing them pain and discomfort. That's not just uh, in, in a private hospital in India, it's universal. If you hurt patients, then the, and the examiners think you've been difficult and unpleasant to the patient, you failed the exam regardless. You know, we'll, you get marked down and you failed instantly. So treat patients with respect. I mean, every now and again, you can cause somebody a little discomfort examining the abdomen in particular. What the examiners will often say that their abdomen's a bit tender, be careful. And then I would let you off if you miss something that was difficult because you were worried about doing deep palpation. So if I give you that warning, then it probably means I'm going to be more forgiving of you missing things. Uh, but do be careful. These are how the seven skills are, are worked uh, by, so along here we have the stations. Stations one, clinical. In clinical, clearly you're not testing clinical communication skills and you're not answering questions. But the other skills are assessed. In history, you're not do examining the patient uh, or uh, identifying signs, but we're assessing you on the other skills. So you're being assessed on all the skills, uh, but it slightly differently in each of the stations. Just as far as he, this is concerned, the clinical examination, just to say that you can, if you can speak the local dialect, it's okay to speak to the patient to give them instructions in what you want to help you with your examination. So you can use local language for that, but anything that's to do with communication has to be done in English. In a real exam, you have two examiners a local examiner who in India is going to be a local Indian examiner, they will know on the exam if you're asking questions you shouldn't ask. Okay? So it's okay to speak local language for instructions, but not to ask them what the diagnosis is. The PASS standard is absolute. So there's no quota. It's not as if 40% PASS. There's a PASS standard which is that you need to pass all seven skills independently and you need a total score of 130 and there's 172 marks available, which works out at about 70%.
So this is not perfection. You can lose marks and pass the exam. The reason that the seven skills are all required is that effectively our, the regulator in the UK had said, well, in the past you could compensate if you were very good at examining a patient, but you couldn't talk to them, you could, you could actually get the necessary marks because you got full marks in one area, but poor marks elsewhere. And our regulator, and it works the same way, others who were wonderful at speaking to patients but couldn't actually find any signs. And we don't want the doctor who only can do one bit right. They've got to be reasonably good at all of it. So you've got to pass all the skills. And this is the pass requirement for the different skills. And you can see we're not looking for perfection again. The lowest mark is the most difficult skill. Skill B, about 58%. And in general, the mark is in the 60s, except for the one about hurting patients. That's got a very high pass mark uh, because we don't want you to hurt any patients. So we're just gonna go through the different clinical skills. Uh, and effectively, this is, as I said, about a structured form you will have in the clinical stations, you have exactly six minutes. You come into the room when the bell goes, six minutes later you have to take your hands off the patient. So you need to practice six minute routines which will allow you to examine respiratory, abdomen, CNS and cardiovascular. If you haven't been doing that now, I would suggest you practice it now. I, I just know in my head what six minutes feels like. And that's what you need to be able to feel like. And I would expect you to be thinking of perhaps in one or two minutes for general examination and the rest of the time for more specific examination of the system. Get colleagues to watch you. Get other people who sat the exam to watch you. Tell you what you're doing right and what you're doing wrong. And although we're going to demonstrate physical examination later this morning, do remember that not all examiners have the same standard. So some will be more demanding in certain areas, more, more forgiving in other areas. We've got 2,000 clinical examiners around the world. They're not all the same. We're not clones of each other, okay? Uh, and as I said, if we see somebody who's very slick in the examination, who's structured, who just, where it flows, that gives us a very good impression and it's likely to help you score marks later on. Whereas if you've got, you keep standing up and saying, what do I do next? And it's all very hesitant and it looks, it doesn't look smooth, then that tends to make us get the impression that you're a weak candidate. So exam technique is important. Identifying signs, as I said, we may be willing to let you miss an occasional sign if we don't think it's that important or it was very difficult. And don't make up signs. We quite often go on, examiners may go on what we call a fishing expedition, which you've told us that there's, uh, that there's a, an ejection systolic murmur. And we'll say, was there a diastolic murmur? We're just wanting you to find out how confident you are. You know, are you? No, no diastolic murmur is the right answer. But because I'm asking that, it's amazing how many candidates suddenly say, oh, uh, yes, there was a, there was a rumbling mid-diastolic murmur. You've just failed yourself. You've got to be confident in what the signs are. Don't make up signs. And again, as, as Prasad said, usually the question is, we, it will be, what are the positive findings? So if you start off with saying then, oh, the patient's sitting comfortably at rest, etc. that's... I've only got four minutes to get a lot of information out of you. I don't want to know that the patient is sitting comfortably in the bed because I can see that myself. I want to know what signs you've picked up. So in the presentation, do listen to the question and, it, it, and what you should be expecting, uh, the, the things we need to mark you on skill-wise when you stand up at the end of six minutes. What, what are the positive signs? What's the differential diagnosis? and something around clinical judgment, perhaps investigation or management. 
So as you're finishing your six minutes, when you're standing up, you should, those are the questions you're going to be asked. So it shouldn't come as a surprise if we say what the signs ask, if we ask you what the signs are. That's almost guaranteed. Okay? Clinical communication, we're testing you on two different skills. In, in station two, it's about your ability to gather a comprehensive history. So that's what you on receive mode. Station four is about you on transmit mode, your ability to actually give difficult information. And often this is around speaking to relatives, speaking to a patient, about either giving bad news, end of life care, uh, ceilings of treatment, about how far you might go perhaps with an elderly patient. It, but it can also be a mistake has been made in the hospital or some form of complaint and you have to deal with that. And then it's your ability to explain what went wrong and to try and pacify what might be an angry surrogate. So that's about your ability to, to actually give information uh, and, and get resolution of a problem. So differential diagnosis I've already alluded to, and it, do remember it's for this particular patient, so think of the patient you're examining, and in this country. So, you know, if, if somebody presents with, uh, with a, it, it's the respiratory case, uh, and, and it's a 20 year old, uh, and there's a pleural effusion, saying that the most likely diagnosis is lung cancer in a 20 year old person uh, is not gonna go well. You know, you've got to think of the age and sex of the patient as far as causes are concerned. So, and for me, I absolutely, I, I, I'm, much, I'm likely to fail people who come out with a, the differential diagnosis which starts with the rarest and most exotic cause for the signs that you found. That some candidates seem to think that it will impress me that you know that an incredibly rare condition could present in this way. Well, that for me is actually a complete waste. And what I want is what's the most likely diagnosis? What's the next most likely? What's the next most likely? And I'll be wanting a differential of the most likely commonest things which could cause this in the country. And clinical judgment I've already alluded to, really just about you know what were these findings, what were the history, what's the diagnosis, uh, how would you investigate, how would you manage? Managing patients' concerns is about answering the questions. ICE is about you know what ideas does the patient have? Do they have what concepts do they have? They often have a, a worry in the background. Do I have cancer? You know, is my mum going to die? And we want you to actually try and get to the bottom of what the patients, and the E is expectations. What are the expectations that the patients or the relatives have of your meeting? And we're wanting you to try and explore some of this, but that'll come out, I'm sure, in tomorrow's lecture on communication skills. And I suppose just the last point there, in some situations, it, you may not know the, the answer to the question. And that can happen, you, you know, you are relatively junior doctors and you're, you're being assessed on general medical knowledge. So it might be in a specialist area, particularly in station four, where it, the right answer might be, I don't know, but I'll speak to my cardiologist and I'll get back to you. But what we're wanting you to is, is to give a positive response. So if you say, I don't know, end of story, that's not helping the patient very much. Whereas if you say, I don't know, but I'm going to find out for you, much better. That works for one or two things. If you just say, I don't know to all the questions, then that's not gonna go well, okay? <laughs> Patient welfare, I've already alluded to. Just don't be rough with the patients. Timings are crucial. This, this exam's a bit like a military campaign. The bells go very, very strictly on time uh, and effectively we'll be policing you so when you're in the hot seat, 
uh, in the next three days and in the exam, then at that point, you that's the end of it and we'll start quizzing you. So six minutes in the clinical stations. And if you think of it, four minutes, I've got four minutes to give you marks on the signs, the differential diagnosis and the management. That means I've got about a minute to give to decide whether you have passed or failed those three skills. If you are very, very hesitant in giving me the signs, and it takes you a couple of minutes to give me the signs, I may not get to discussing clinical judgment, in which case I don't give you any marks. So sometimes people seem to think if I'm very slow and I, and I, and I pause and I hesitate, then that means I, I, I'll get less difficult questions. Yes, but it also means that I can't assess the skills and you won't get the marks. Station two and four, you have 14 minutes with the patient and we tell you and there's two minutes left. You've then got a minute to think and then five minutes of questioning. 14 minutes is longer than you think. So again, for practice over the next few weeks for those sitting the exam, try and take a history in 14 minutes, see how long it's taking you. We often get people who rush into it and they stop at eight minutes. We'll, we, in, in the talking stations, we will, the surrogate remains in the room for 14 minutes, we don't ask you questions. And you then have a very uncomfortable few minutes where you're just sitting in the room with everyone looking at you, waiting for you to say something. And that usually means, almost certainly, that you have rushed through the history. So that means you've missed things, and it's very difficult to work out what you've missed at the, after eight minutes later. So think of what 14 minutes feels like, practice it. In station five, which is complicated, uh, and you'll get plenty of experience of it on station on the day three, eight minutes with a patient and two minutes with us. But eight minutes in which you take a history and examine the patients. So that's a, bit, a busy eight minutes. Okay, so the, I think I, I won't go into answer questions at the moment because I, I want to just very quickly go over the clinical examination uh, stations with you a little more. And w I'm going to be beating all of you over the next few days. So if there's questions on structure, basically all of the, as I said, all the teachers are PACES examiners and will be able to answer your queries. So I think I'll just quickly go on uh, to stations one and three. Uh, so these are the five skills. You've already, we've already talked about them. And we've talked about calibration. So patients are examined independently by both examiners. I actually don't like to know the diagnosis before I examine the patients. I want to be like you. So I just know it's a chest case, and I'll go in and examine it. Other examiner then examines, and then we write down the mark, the signs, and then we agree the signs. The differential diagnosis takes into account country and the age and sex, and the management agreed. If I want to, to know what the investigations of the, in which should be, I'll ask my local examiner. Remember in the exam, there's always going to be a local examiner and a UK examiner. The UK examiner is there to ensure it's the same standard wherever you sit the exam in the world. The local examiner is to make sure that the differential diagnosis in the, is correct, because it's the one for the country. So I'll ask my Indian colleague, what, what would you see as the most likely diagnosis for you know, a pleural effusion or for hepatosplena megaly. Uh, so uh, you, it, it's relevant. And the same for investigations. Uh, so for example, in signs, uh, if I, you know, if, I, if it's hepatosplena megaly and it's the UK, then it's the, in the exam, it's quite often hematology that's going to have caused that or alcoholic liver disease much less likely it's alcoholic liver disease if it's a country that has no alcohol, or at least legally has no alcohol. Uh, and equally, uh, in, if I'm in Egypt, 
it's probably going to be hepatitis. If I'm in Bangladesh, it might be Kala Azar. So different differentials around the world and the same for investigations. The investigation opportunities that we have in the UK or Singapore is very different from the investigations of a similar condition that might take place in Myanmar or Sudan, just because there are different investigations available. You know, in a, a high-tech country that perhaps overuses scans to a country where clinical skills are paramount because they don't have the same resources in, for investigation. The timing we've talked about, and I just, it is about these four minutes, and that's about the presentation skills that we were talked about. Be slick in standing up, telling us what are the signs, what you think the differential diagnosis is, and then answer our questions, usually to do with investigation or management. And if you're slow and hesitant, then you're probably going to drop marks. And I sometimes get patients, candidates, who freeze on me. You just, they won't talk to me. I, you know, I'm asking questions, I'm not getting any answers, and it's sort of, if you don't speak to me, I can't give you any marks. But these things happen. This is a stressful example. So when you come into the room, there will be a, a stem, something written on the wall, or a, a sheet of paper by the bedside. And that usually just is, this patient's breathless, examine their respiratory system. So it doesn't necessarily give you a lot of information, but sometimes, for example, this gentleman has abdominal pain, examine the abdomen, that abdominal pain might be a clue. Or it might be this patient with a chronic, has a chronic cough, examine the respiratory system. You know, that, as far as I'm concerned, that's bronchiectasis until proved otherwise. So, you know, the, I don't tend to give stems, I don't tend to write stems that give you a lot of extra information. Um, the, so you've got the six minutes, uh, two for general examination, roughly four for specifics. If you stand up, abdomen is the one that people uh, tend to finish a little early. Do make sure if you stand up early, we can start asking you questions straight away in these stations. So if you stand up early, you're giving us more chance to ask you difficult questions. I would suggest you use your six minutes uh, to actually make full use of that time. If you're not sure about a sign, you've, you may have time to go back and check it. Equally, I, have, I see candidates who take three or four minutes to do a wonderful general examination of the chest, but they haven't actually touched the chest yet. You've then got two minutes to do everything in the front and the back not possible. I have other people, we, and when you have six minutes, we tell you when there's one minute left, quite common in the chest that somebody hasn't even started on the back when they've got one minute left. And then they've got to rush through examination at the back of the chest, which is probably the area they're most likely to have the signs. So do think about how you're going to examine. Most examiners aren't particularly precious. Uh, Venkat's going to be teaching it later on today, I think, about respiratory, so he'll tell you. But most, for me, I don't mind if you start on the front or the back of the chest. It, you're, I'm not going to fail you, depending on how you do it, as long as it's structured and it looks as if you've done it before. And these, really, I think we've talked about already. So think you've only got about a minute for each of the skills to impress us. So this is just very quickly talking about uh, the different stations. So stations one, in respiratory, this is one of the stations where, the, the ones where people have difficulty finishing in six minutes, I would say primarily are chest and abdomen. Uh, sorry, chest and neuro. Abdomen, they usually finish early, uh, and cardiac, usually they finish on time. Don't spend too much time on general examination, but you do need to look at the, at the basics. Uh, for me, okay to start on the front or the back, just make sure you do it. Uh, and again, for me, checking every intercostal space for vocal fremitus and vocal resonance, remember you've only got six minutes. If you take huge amounts of time testing each skill, you'll run out of time, or each sign rather. For the abdomen, look closely for scars, chronic liver disease, 
I'd have to say that renal transplants, uh, people with renal disease present commonly because they're stable. Please look for shunts in arms because they're if you if somebody's got a shunt, particularly in their left arm, and they've got their pajamas down, it's amazing how often people miss a major shunt. Uh, it's a huge clue. You know, you, you're either looking for a transplant or polycystic kidneys, probably. So if you find if you find the shunt, you're laughing. And look for nodes, as I said, hematological problems, uh, myeloproliferative, uh, are, are very common because, again, they've got stable signs. Uh, they tend to have fairly big organomegaly. They may have nodal disease. So if you're thinking hematology, then make sure we've seen you look for nodes. Cardio, general examination, clearly important. We're expecting you to tell us about the pulse, uh, JVP, uh, looking for cyanosis, finding apex beat, etc. Uh, auscultate the, the, the patient. And I said we might, we might forgive you if you miss a difficult murmur. We will if you've positioned the patient to maximize your chances. So if you've turned the patient over on the lateral side,